Hey, good morning. Um, so, um, thank you very much, Atul, uh, for uh, the introduction and for the invitation to speak. Uh, I am very much out of, um, I'm very much out, of, I'm very much out of uh, place over here because I am a, a pure computer scientist. I don't really uh, work in uh, in sensors. Um, I am uh, uh, working uh, mostly on cybersecurity. However, my research has brought me to work on cyber physical systems. And cyber physical systems are very much defined as having an interface with the physical world, which is looking back to it. So it's uh, interesting to, to be here and to hear about uh, uh, sensors technologies. Now, um, <coughs> there is a reason why we are very worried about cyber physical systems in cybersecurity. And the reason is that uh, uh, cyber physical systems are systems that people can see and can immediately perceive as being very relevant. Um, and this is uh, true throughout the world. So for instance, the uh, former vice president of the European Commission, uh, Vivian Redding, uh, that in a, a memorable speech, uh, uh, used the security of Europe's critical infrastructure as one of the key objectives of not this commission, of the previous European Commission, and this commission has continued to grow. Uh, it has attracted a lot of uh, political attention because, uh, of course, uh, systems such as water distribution or transportation are critical to society. And they are all uh, cyber physical systems. Uh, at the same time, uh, cyber physical systems are often systems that uh, have safety constraints and that involve danger for your one life. I will uh, just use an example example of industrial robots that have been the subject of much of our research recently. Um, industrial robots uh, used to be like this, so they still are very much like this, so they used to be uh, large-scale manipulators that are confined in so-called protected spaces. Now, uh, if a robot is confined in a protected space, uh, the robot uh, uh, cannot interact or interfere with human life. If you open up the gates of this protected space, the robot immediately stops. And this is realized with an electrical contact. So uh, the robot motors uh, lose power and the brakes are enacted, whatever the computer is telling to the robot. So if you are an aggressor and you penetrate into the controller of this robot, you can make this robot damage the production, but this robot will not be able to harm a human because the safety measure protecting the human is not software. Now, robotics is going towards uh, robots that are so-called cooperative robots. For instance, this is Yumi. Uh, Yumi is an uh, ABB uh, robot that is designed to work with you. And as you can see, it has several characteristics that make it uh, um, usable for humans. So for instance, it's not a huge, imposing, scary robot. It's actually a cute robot with two arms, and it looks a little bit like a human torso. And uh, um, Yumi is very safe. It, it is literally impossible for a human to do something as unexpected as it may be in order to get uh, in the way of Yumi in such a way that Yumi harms the human. There's a lot of safeguards built in, built of sensors, built of software, built of constant computation of the power and the speed uh, and the resistance that uh, the arms of the robot are encountered. But all of these countermeasures are software driven. So if somebody hacks into Yumi, they can disable the software me safeguard measures. Whereas instead, if somebody hacked into these industrial manipulators, they would not be able to endanger a human. So with uh, more sophisticated um, uh, cyber physical systems that are closer to humans, uh, we have safety constraints that are depending critically on the security of the devices that are handling it. Also, Cyber physical systems are more and more autonomous. They are uh, uh, relying on automation. Uh, think of the autonomous vehicles, for instance, which is the classical example. <coughs> but uh, um, automation for humans has always evoked fear. So um, these are images from a um, film that you probably will uh, remember. If you don't, uh, go watch it. It's a War Games. It's a film from 1984. And it's a film that, for people of my generation, uh, and for people that took my line of job, um, uh, is, is a very important film because it uh, showed the very first depiction of a hacker in a movie, of a young hacker, Matthew Broderick. Um, I will not spoil what the film is about uh, for those that uh, may have not seen it, but uh, the film is not about hacking. 
hacking is the tool of the film, the, the, sceno, the scenic tool of the film, but the film is about fear of automation. In the film, the predicate is that somebody thought that it would be a good idea to connect a critical system, nuclear weapons, to an AI. Obviously, in 1984, that was kind of science fiction. Nowadays, it could be something scientifically doable. Any time we do um, realize an automated system, we are taking away human control, and we must confront the fear of automation that most humans have. Now, the fear of automation is combined with the fear of uh, uh, security hacking. Now, we need to be able to guarantee that cyber physical systems that are entering our life uh, are secure. Um, the problem is that uh, in, in our world, for cybersecurity people like me, in particular for people that like me come from what is called the offensive side of security, we uh, apply um, a hack and patch kind of thing. So, for instance, uh, one of our uh, research lines a few years back uh, dealt with social authentication. It was a mechanism of authentication that Facebook had devised that based on your knowledge of your friends. And we demonstrated that it did not work. How? By breaking into it. That's, that's how we do things in cyber. The problem is that with cyber physical systems, we cannot really do that. The reason is uh, twofold. One of the reasons comes from uh, uh, an observation made by this uh, gentleman over here, uh, whose name is Dan Gear. Now, if you have never, uh, if you have one hour to spend for a course, on cybersecurity, don't do a course. Go and find Dan Kier's keynote at Blackett in 2014. It's one hour of talk, and it's the best source of knowledge that you can find in cybersecurity, because Dan is probably the best cybersecurity expert in the planet. <laughs> now, in this talk, he pointed out one thing. The thing is this. Whenever we apply a penetrate and patch scheme, what we are implicitly supposing is that there is a finite number, a small finite number of vulnerabilities in a system. If there is a finite number of vulnerabilities in a system, then by penetrating it and patching them one by one, we can solve a problem. If instead vulnerabilities are dense in systems and we have, we have no proof that they are dense or sparse, but our experience tells us that probably they are dense, then penetrating and patching is like playing a game of whack-a-mole. You, you, you try to whack the, the mole that is coming out of the holes, and the mole keeps coming out of the other hole. Um, by squashing one vulnerability at a time, we are not going to solve the problem, in particular in cyber-physical systems, where we start from a, a, a starting point of systems that are very old in many cases and that are not designed to be secure. Um, and the, the second uh, part of this line of reasoning comes from uh, an observation that I found in uh, several different uh, areas in cybersecurity. So this is an example that comes uh, from uh, Buzz Albert. <laughs> um, is uh, that in the end, we cannot really focus on making bugs disappear. In the end, in cybersecurity, what we are trying to do is to deny an agent, the attacker, to obtain their goal. So if an attacker is able to exploit a system, but by exploiting the system, they don't get to their goal, we are absolutely fine with it. Now, in cyber physical systems, uh, this basically means that rather than trying to keep the attacker out of each single microcontroller, of each single computer in a robot, for instance, or in a vehicle, we need to try to make it so that the attacker's goals are denied even if they have attacked the system. So I will try, uh, I will draw an example from all the research. So you can uh, find the original paper for this uh, if you. Uh, if you want, it's linked uh, on the slides, uh, and it's also in the um, it's also in the background. Uh, this 
paper was presented at security and privacy in 2017, and then at bracket. Now, we broke into, uh, um, into uh, uh, industrial robots. It was the first security analysis of industrial robot that ever. <laughs> and uh, in the security circus, what I like to call the security circus, the security circus, there's attractions. There's people like me that are clowns. We put our red nose on and we juggle our, our, uh, our bottles. Um, and the circus cheered for the different vulnerabilities we found. And I will not dive into the, uh, into the detail because uh, probably for this uh, crowd, it's not uh, very interesting, but they were textbook vulnerabilities. Like uh, in, industri in uh, the industrial robot we analyzed, the robot used no code signing. So whenever it loaded its code, it loaded the code from the network without actually controlling that the code was real code. Um, it would uh, blindly believe a set of configuration protocols that were not authenticated. So the robot would blindly accept parameters supplied by an attacker. In the code of the programs, uh, there were textbook buffer overflow vulnerabilities. If you have uh, had any course in cybersecurity where you have looked at what a buffer overflow vulnerability is, is this is pretty much the textbook example that you found in the first slide of the class. And it's in the real code that is running on a robot that costs $70,000. Now, this is all interesting for security people. But what actually is more interesting uh, is that, well, after seeing this presentation, in particular at Black, at not the one at the scientific conference, because nobody cared about it. Uh, in the journalism world. After seeing the presentation at Blackett, we had these headlines appear on the, on the press, which of course are misguided. That's not what the paper was about. And the resulting public perception was something like this, that we had created some monstrous terminator. But in reality, what is interesting in the paper is the boring part that comes afterwards. What we did in the paper was we tried to figure out what the attacker would do with a compromised robot. We tried to show the exploitation strategies for a compromised robot and how to deny those strategies. You don't want to go and secure all of the code that runs on the robot because that's impossible. What you want to do is to build an architecture for the robot that even in the compromise of one of the computers or more, the nice to the attacker to perform one of their goals, which could be compromising the safety of a person or compromising the quality of the product without humans realizing. <laughs> so summarizing, I said, we need to think systemic, systemically and so not to think to the specific vulnerability, but rather to deny the, um, to deny the attacker their, uh, their goal and to create what is called usually resilience. As a second example, we need to embed security in the design process and to make security decisions to be risk-driven. And use automotive as an example. Now, in automotive, you may have seen this because it happened uh, it, uh, it the press as well, not just uh, our scientific publication. Um, two, uh, two colleagues, two engineers from uh, the US, uh, Chris Ballas and Charlie Miller, um, demonstrated a hack on a Jeep, on a FCA Jeep uh, vehicle. And they demonstrated the hack in this way. They put uh, Andy Greenberg, uh, the journalist that wrote that, uh, that piece over there, in the vehicle, Andy drove the vehicle, and Chris uh, uh, and Charlie took over control of the vehicle and drove him off the road from remote, from another state. The same attack, had been shown in 2010 in a scientific conference. The very same. It was not on a Jeep, it was on a Toyota, on a Toyota vehicle, but it was the very same attack. The point is, as, as I said before, that people do not care about scientific conferences. So in 2010, uh, there was absolutely no uh, impact from this research. In 2016, they had an impact. Now, when they had the impact, uh, 
uh, two things happened. The cybersecurity world started to look into vehicles and to say, oh, there's all these sorts of ways to penetrate into vehicles. And there's been a lot of research on vehicle security. Now, this is the summary of every single paper on vehicle security that you can find out there. They are all the same. The attacker finds a one weak point on one of the external accesses of the onboard vehicle network. There's a number on each vehicle today. The infotainment system that is connected to a cell phone and to the internet. On most vehicles, there is a so-called e-call box that is used for emergency assistance to the vehicle that is connected to the internet with a machine-to-machine -machine SIM card permanently connected. Um, and, uh, uh, on most of these devices, there's no security. So you break into one of these devices, then you are on the in-vehicle network, and you can do whatever you want, because the in-vehicle network has been designed since the past 30 years to blindly deliver whatever is circulating. It's simply a bus network. Whatever message you inject on that network is going to be deleted. Period. Every single attack is like that. Now, we can produce, I, if, you, if we bring like a, a car in the courtyard, I can swear we can produce in the next four hours another paper like this. Because there's hundreds of vulnerabilities. We could produce endless papers like this. What's the usefulness? None. None because uh, uh, what will happen is then that the industry will do exactly what it has done for the Jeep attack. They sent to each owner of the vehicle a USB key in, via, via, via regular mail, instructing the um, owner to put the USB key into the vehicle and let the USB key refresh the vehicle with the new software. Now, aside, setting aside the fact that this obviously closes that one vulnerability and not the other thousand vulnerabilities that are not there, any security expert screamed at the idea of training people to insert unknown USB keys into your vehicle and letting an unknown USB key reprogram your vehicle. But this is the only way to do it, because most devices that are cyber physical are not easily repatchable. This is, I mean, this is funny that you do it, but there's no other way to do it. And if you think of other type of cyber physical systems, it's even worse. Like uh, if you have a cardiac, system, a cardiac implantable system, how do you reflash it if it has a vulnerability? You need the person to be in a hospital because when you reflash it, you will break it. If you break it, the person dies. So there's no good way to patch this system. This system needs to be designed to be secure. There's a lot of care research out there, a lot of automotive security research out there, but the, the, um, the thing is that these are is like uh, saying, oh, we need to substitute CAN, which is the bus that vehicles use, with this different thing. Nobody's going to do that. It's impractical. The second thing is, oh, we have this uh, magic intrusion detection system that we can sprinkle like fairy dust on the, uh, on the CAN network, and it will block attacks. Now, my PhD thesis in 2006 was about intrusion detection with, uh, with artificial intelligence. I can tell you, because I have done a lot of research on that, it doesn't work. It doesn't work well enough to be used on a vehicle. And the third idea is, OK, let's keep squashing bugs one by one. That doesn't work either. What works? What works is to try to build security into the design of the network, not to try to make each single component on the network Uh, and uh, if you are interested in this methodology, you will find a reference uh, in, the, in the paper related to that. So basically, what I've shown is that uh, there are two main approaches that we need to take for securing cyber physical systems. One approach is uh, trying to um, figure out what the attacker wants to do and trying to deny that attack. The second approach is trying to build these architectural into systems, not trying to focus on the single vulnerabilities, but trying to focus on the resilience as a whole. Thank you very much.